All right, now Chris from his house, Waterbury. Um, I commented on his video. He made a nice video about um, the cost of uh, you know the gift, and essentially, uh, you know, it's really a small price to pay for being a Christian. If you compare that with not being a Christian and the price you're gonna to have to pay a uh, huge difference right so I mean we we suffer for being a Christian but it's nothing like the suffering that happens to them that are not saved right so anyways uh, nice video on Hammonds and I just commented because he he made a comment in the video depending on which translation you use and so I'm gonna stand uh, strong and uh, steadfast that I believe the King James Bible is the pure Word of God and he, he comes up with a great response here he says Merry Christmas thanks for the insight we've got to talk about King James only I'm intrigued I don't agree but I'm open to hearing your rationale so that's a great comment anybody that's willing to listen uh, to me it, it shows that they really truly do care about the truth more than anything in the world I mean really what's more important than the truth <laughs> there's nothing more important so I, I told him I make this quick I'm gonna try to make this quick so let's get into it okay first of all just from a logical standpoint you believe in a God that can part the Red Sea that can heal the maim the you know people like when uh, the soldier had his arm his hand cut off Jesus healed it he healed the, the sick and so on he can do all of these miracles and God can raise us from the dead you believe in all those things then you ought to also believe that he can give us a perfect Bible in our own language all right so I'm not really I don't have a script or anything so I'm just gonna go uh, through a few verses here and just give some uh, some thought to this and so in Acts 2 are you familiar with Acts 2? The, there's a verse here that says, How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? So the miracle, if you will, of this moment is that every man was able to hear the Word of God in their own tongue. Now, we can also go to Isaiah. Oops, if I could spell. And read this verse here for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people and of course we got a parallel or a you know a, yeah par I guess we call it a parallel verse in the New Testament men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people and yet for all that will they not hear me saith the Lord in the law it is written with men of other tongues this is pointing back to the verse I just read with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people and yet for all that will they not hear me saith the Lord and of course uh, it's accepted history that uh, much of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew ancient Hebrew and then the New Testament written in Koine Greek and I'm saying none of that matters none of that matters those are languages and as Paul points out the languages come and go you know the language where there whether there be tongues which is languages they shall cease and of course we'll go to uh, is it Zephaniah I think Zephaniah 3 for then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent now in the context of this verse it's talking about the life to come 
after judgment day after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and we are lifted up to meet him in the air and our enemy is destroyed forever okay where there's no more pain no more sorrow no more suffering no more death as we read in Revelation 21 so that's the context of Zephaniah 3 when it says then will he turn to us a pure language all right and so all right and then let's go to I mean there's a couple more verses I need to hit first what's the password for heaven and earth okay heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away all right so the word of the Lord endures forever and uh, again we get confirmation of that in I think first Peter second Peter, first Peter but the word of the Lord endures forever and uh, the great verse here for all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of grass the grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away but the word of the Lord endures forever and this is the word by which by the gospel is preached unto you and of course of course so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God so the word of God endures forever languages come and go but the word of God endures forever so if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God then we ought to have a perfect Bible right so uh, if we go to let's do it this way let's do it this way here if I can think I want to throw in a verse there okay there we go I think I got it all right so in Deuteronomy 8 that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread only but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live and he answered and said it is written man should not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God Jesus answered it is written that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word of God so if we have if we are to live by every word of God we ought to have every word of God now well, let's take a look at a few more verses here the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times thou shalt keep them O Lord thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever all right and let's go back I didn't I probably should have did it different but who cares um, let's go to Psalm 119 thy word is very pure therefore thy servant loveth it every word of God is pure he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him now uh, so the idea I want to present is that we, the word of God is perfect all right and even Jesus says the scripture cannot be broken <clears throat> all right and um, so if you have if you have a broken scripture then it's not the true scripture right and um, so let's go to and let's look at the flip side real quick for we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God in 2nd Corinthians 7 or I'm sorry 2nd Corinthians 2 uh, so uh, this was happening at that time it's, it's happened you know there's um, verses uh, in the Old Testament that warn against uh, corrupting the Word of God if you will and 
you know, prophets that are, or false prophets that are claiming God said this when God never said that, those sorts of things. So this is not a new idea of corrupting the Bible. This is um, something that's been going on forever. And so if you examine the Bible, uh, just as it says, study to show thyself approved. All right, so when we study the Bible, rightly dividing the word of truth, and we collate different Bible versions, there is no way to get around it. Not all Bibles say the same thing. That's a problem. And so I remember early on as a Christian and wanting to sort of catch up with everybody else because I wasn't saved until I was 31. And, you know, never grew up in a church, didn't really have any idea. I was just, you know, grew up my entire life against Christianity, against the Bible. And so I, I had a lot of catching up to do. And I was reading and studying hard and trying to learn, trying to figure things out. And, you know, one of the most obvious things is why are there all these different Bible versions well the answer that I was given is that well the Bible versions base their translation off of the originals uh, you know the Hebrew and the and the Koine Greek and I thought oh okay well if you know if you know me you know when I was in high school I uh, took foreign uh, classes Spanish and German and being that my name is German, I, I took German and Spanish being a popular second language. Uh, I did okay in Spanish, but in German, <laughs> I got like 9%. And I think that's a record that stands even today for the lowest possible percentage in any class, in any school, anywhere in the world for all time. The worst of the worst. I mean, I was terrible in German. And if I don't understand German, how in the world am I going to understand ancient Hebrew or Koine Greek? I don't have a chance, man. I don't even, I don't understand Spanish. How I got a passing grade is beyond me. But nevertheless, if we go back to those verses that I shared, with men of other tongues and other lips, well, I speak unto this people. So I don't have to learn Hebrew. I don't have to learn Greek. I don't have to learn Chinese. All I have to do is know my own language. And I'm still learning my own language. I'm still learning English, right? And, you know, go back to the very first verse here. How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Uh, amazing that, you know, everybody in their own language ought to and can hear the Word of God. And what's one of the things that is essentially commanded that we do until the end of the world, until the end of time? And the gospel must first be published among all nations and then the end will come if I'm recalling this correctly uh, there's probably another verse here that probably says that better let me see if I can find it real quick if I can't who cares in, the, in this gospel the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations and then the end shall come alright so uh, the God, it's important that every country has, or every language has the gospel preached. All right. So in it, so we're not. There's no mention of okay, you got to go out and teach everybody Hebrew and everybody Greek. That's not. Those are languages that have passed away. Nobody today is born into those languages. And you know what else is interesting? I found out that I was lied to um, because uh, you know I was told that we have all these translations because they are based on the originals well 
I got curious one day and I thought, well, let's, I want to, you know, take a look at the originals myself. I want to see if I can figure out some stuff. Maybe there's some secrets I can learn. Some things that people don't know that are in the originals. And in my, uh, you know, internet search, I realized, you know what? There are no originals. There are manuscripts, and in fact, there are tens of thousands of manuscripts. So, all these translations are picking and choosing which manuscript to translate from. And uh, they're, not all the manuscripts agree. Now, of course, I don't know any of this. I'm being told this. I can't tell you because I don't speak any of the languages of these foreign manuscripts. But if there was one manuscript that was accepted as the perfect Word of God, then there ought to be a consensus that this is the perfect, pure Word of God. And there is none. So let's go into the Bible and take a look. If I can remember the verse... Exodus 32, and it came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. This is after Moses received the Ten Commandments by, the, by God, written with the finger of God. <clears throat> okay, this, is, this has got to be the most valuable piece of stone in the world. The most important Bible. The, the, origin, the originals, the very originals, written with the finger of God. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. And then Mo Moses had to have been super excited. He's got this table of stone that has the commandments of God written with the finger of God. Probably couldn't have been more excited and more just overjoyed and then he comes down and he sees all his people dancing and doing the boogie woogie and worshiping this calf and Moses instantly flipped turned like that and his anger waxed hot and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. He broke the, the originals. So if the, the originals were that important, Moses would not have been so hot, so angry, and broke them. The, so what happened, what ended up happening is, is God rewrote them. So it doesn't matter the stone, it doesn't matter the language, it doesn't matter the paper. The Word of God endures forever, throughout all languages, for all time, forever and ever. Alright, and so, uh, you know, I want to make this short. There's more that I could add. Um, maybe, let me add one more segment here. Alright, let's go back to uh, a little collating, if you will. So if we take a look here. I'll try to make this short, but give two examples here. Go to 2 Corinthians 2.17. Now we can look at, you know, I think there's over 50. The last time I counted, there was 50-some different translations here. All right, and you, you'll notice, we'll take some of the, the more popular ones. I think the NIV is pretty popular. Unlike so many, we do not peddle the Word of God. Okay, so the problem with that is that they do peddle their version, their Bible version. They absolutely peddle. They sell it. That's what peddling means, that to sell it. All right, and then and I, whatever this version is, we aren't selling God's Word. So they've taken whatever um, uh, Greek word and they've changed it around enough. It's like taking the word dog and then going through the various translations and bringing it back to English and making the word dog mean cat. And so I think this is a very important verse for them to change the Word of God 
Uh, one, in, in my contention, is that they're doing this so that they can abide by the copyright laws so they can sell their Bibles. I don't believe any of these Bible versions are translated based on any manuscript. I know that's the claim. That's what they all claim, but I don't believe any of them. I think they're all lying. I think they're basing it 100% on copyright law so they can sell their book and make the money. That's what I believe. Whether that's it's a minor point, it really is, but uh, it's important in my opinion. Is what are they basing? Uh, when you look at all these words, where's the NASB? The NASB, for we are not as many. They use the word pedal too. And of course, I contend strongly contend that the King James Bible is not a version; it is the Bible. All right, the ESV, another popular one, peddlers of God's word I right, see and the Douay reams alterating the word of God's so that's better than peddling but the Douay reams is a Catholic Bible and obviously I got problems with the Catholic Bible and the, the Amplified is one of the most silliest Bible versions you'll ever read also says peddling God's word all right, so there's a lot of problems with, with uh, what was that word? Hijacked? Who said that? Oh, huckstering. Maybe that's what I saw. Huckstering. Yeah, that's a great word, huh? All right, who cares? They preach God's word to make money. Well, uh, you're selling your Bible version to make money, so that's a problem. So let's take a look at uh, some uh, examples of of how they are twisting the scripture that is that is affecting doctrine all right so if we go to Titus uh, I have to remember the verse here give me a second um, yeah. let me think about this a second uh, What is this here? The Christian Standard Bible. Oh my goodness. Okay. Is this the verse that I'm looking for? There it is. Okay. Alright. This is not the version I wanted. I don't know why it came up that. That's ridiculous. But anyways. Uh, Titus 3.10. Reject a divisive person. Alright. So think about that. You're a preacher, and you got a congregation of people, and you're standing in front of them, in front of God, in front of everybody, and you're preaching Titus 3, verse 10. And it says, reject a divisive person. All right? And then let's flip over to, um, to what Jesus says. That's a, that's a pretty good verse here. Think not that I come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. And a sword meaning division. All right, let's say that's not good enough for you. Let's go to Luke 12, verse 21. Suppose ye that I come to give peace on earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. Now, think about this. Jesus has come to bring division. He even goes into how he will um, he will pit family members against one another. Oops. Oh my goodness, I don't know. This is why I gotta keep reading the Bible. Because I don't know stuff. A man's foe shall be they of his own household. Alright, so he will set you know, brother against brothers, father against son, son against father, and so on and so forth. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. For I, for I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Some of these are easier to understand than others, right? But the bottom line is the fact of the matter is 
Jesus comes to bring division, to separate the saved from the unsaved. And then, of course, we'll use a Christian Standard Bible as an example. And it's telling you to reject a divisive person. You're able to put two and two together. You can say, well, Jesus is divisive. If Jesus is divisive, and the Bible says reject a divisive person, then we got to reject Jesus Christ. That's plain and simple. That's a problem, man. That's a problem. And I was, for a long time, I was confounded with this stuff. I mean, how do you reconcile this? You, the only way to reconcile it is to ignore the versions you don't agree with and accept the versions that you agree with. And the problem with that is now you become your own authority. You become the authority on the Word of God. You're putting yourself before God. I can't do that. I honestly cannot do that. And so if we take a look at Titus 3.10, and what does the King James Bible say? A man that is an heretic. Now that's, that's very different than what we're reading here in the Christian Standard Bible. Reject the device of person. A man that is an heretic, you could argue is divisive, but um, there, to me these words matter, and there's a big difference between heretic and a divisive person, because Jesus is div divisive, but he's not an heretic. Huge difference. All right, that's one example, and then I can give you a real quick one here, if we go to Matthew 18, I believe it is. Let's go to the Christian Standard Bible. All right, since we got this one up, and you could collate this with other Bible versions as well. And you'll notice, I mean, imagine you're a little child. You're like, uh, you know, five years old, and you you're going through the Bible, and you know you can count to, you know, twenty. You can count to a hundred. Whatever. You're pretty smart. You may, maybe I should lower the age, I don't remember. At three years old. Let's say you're three years old, you can count to 20, and you're a pretty smart little kid. And you're reading, all right? So 18 would signify one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And they left out 11. Wouldn't that be a little bit confusing for a little child to, to see this and say, what, well, this is wrong. This is very wrong. That, that, uh, that's missing 11. They removed 11. There's no way to wiggle around it, man. There's no way you can put that right there, that little serpent's note. That doesn't change the fact that they've completely removed verse 11. And what does verse 11 say? For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Alright, so I know the argument is, well, those verses are put in there by man. Well, that's not what I believe. I don't believe that at all. I believe that God is in control of the Bible. we got 66 verses in the Bible. I believe God is responsible for every one of them. And we can go and we can see by the Bible uh, even it says, uh, let's see here that, there's a lot of verses that, that talk about the book of the Lord, huh? But specifically I wanted to if, if I could find Isaiah there are a lot of verses that tell us to read the book of the Word of the book of the Lord. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. Alright? So, here in Acts 13, it even mentions, because I've heard the argument, well, the numbers are there by man. And, no, second psalm right there, it says specifically, the second psalm. And, of course, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. 
and so now you have to narrow down your argument well the number of the verses are from man and the number of the chapters are from God well uh, it's all I firmly believe that it's all from God God is control of his book I declare the decree the Lord has said unto me thou art my son this day have I begotten thee all right so that's a parallel verse now um, just quite simply uh, you think about uh, you know I I'll, I'll go back to when I you know I wanted to look at the originals and I found out there was no originals so I wanted to look and see if there was a, a way to read the originals to fit my worldview, if you will. That's essentially, if I'm being honest, that's what I wanted to do. And I've since come to realize that the, the secret or the key to understanding the Bible is not having the originals, not reading the Word of God in foreign languages that I have absolutely no understanding of. The key or the secret of the Bible, of understanding the Bible, is faith. It's amazing, really. Because, you know why? Because it's always been about faith. All the way back to Noah. Noah, by faith, Noah being born of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. It's always been about faith. And even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Second Corinthians 3. The veil is upon their heart, even unto this day. Why? because they don't believe nevertheless when it shall turn to the Lord the veil shall be taken away it's about faith it's always been about faith and so you ought to have you ought to believe you have to have faith in the Bible that you hold in your hands all right and that Bible that I hold in my hands is the King James Bible and obviously, I think there 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 is um, much study re required to see that all these translations. Um, you know, let's go to all these modern translations. There's a problem with them when you collate the different Bible versions. You can't reconcile the differences because they flat out contradict one another and as we've seen in Matthew 18 verse 11 there's many other verses but that they completely omit them and of course the reason that they're giving for omitting them is that well some manuscripts don't have it well if you're going to base it off of some manuscripts well some manuscripts don't include entire books of the Bible so I don't see you removing entire books of the Bible right there's a problem with that philosophy all right it's not consistent and instead of uh, basing the Word of God on um, you know, what it says you're basing it on what you want it to say right and that's a big problem and the word Lucifer is, uh, is another example you see here you do a word search for Lucifer Lucifer is one of the most popular names in the world today right but I'm going to end it on this. I'm going to end it on an ugly note here. All right. Isaiah 14, 12. And we type in Lucifer. And boy, there's over 50 translations here, but it's only mentioned 14 times. Boy, that's kind of odd. How many people out there today have a Bible that never mentions the name Lucifer? Well, anybody could tell you Lucifer comes from the Bible. Well, if you have an NIV, it doesn't. It's not in your Bible, anywhere. And the problem is here, they've taken Lucifer, which is very important, by the way. I have very strong opinions on that word Lucifer. I won't get into that right now. But 
the NIV has changed Lucifer and turned it into Morning Star. Now where have I heard Morning Star before? Let's take a quick look here. In Revelation 22, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So you've probably heard kids make the argument that, well, Jesus is the morning star. And this is what they're getting it from. The NIV has changed Lucifer and giving him a, a title, if you will, of Jesus and, and that's a problem it really is it's a big problem when you collate these different versions all they they do change doctrine and, and you know look, let's I gotta get in I gotta share one more verse because it changes the most important doctrine the most important doctrine you can ever learn let's see if I can I want to I want to uh, I want to find the one verse that matters here that's gonna make it the most obvious here the one verse oh I didn't realize there was that many I believe no nope. Let me try this here. I apologize for this ignorance. That's not it either. All right, so forgive me. Let's do it this way. Let's do it this way here. Those of us that are saved, oh, I'm not sure this is going to be. Oh my goodness, I got to think about it so I can cheat and take the easy route. All right, I apologize for this right here. This is what I want to. This is what I want to share here. That's the verse right there. First Corinthians. That's what it is. Boy, I'm dumber than dog do. Dumber than dog do. I can't remember. This is why I got to read more because I don't remember stuff. And I'm getting older. And I'm, that's not going to help. All right, so First Corinthians 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved. We are saved right now. It is the power of God. We are saved right now. And of course, I've got a problem. I've got a problem with that. Let's take the NIV. If I can find it. Uh, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. Are you being saved or are you saved right now? That's absolutely critical it's important to know important to understand and we ought to know we ought to know that we are saved if I can find a verse here that that would that would um, that that we should know that we have know that we should have eternal life we should know that we are saved right and this is life eternal that they might know the okay that's not the verse but okay um, right there that ye may know that ye have eternal life these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life it's important to know that we have eternal life and not just know that we have eternal life but that we can be confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it 
until the day of Jesus Christ. We are saved right now. We that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are born of God. We are saved right now and forever. And we are sealed unto the day of redemption. All right, and make no mistake about it. I don't want anybody out there thinking that they have to work for their salvation because there's example after example all throughout the Bible and in your own life that you will screw it up. If it, if you if it's possible for you to screw it up, you're going to screw it up. All right, but thanks be to God, we cannot screw up our salvation once we are saved, we are sealed, secured, sanctified forever. All right. So, um that's probably I hope this is not too long. I hope you find time to uh, listen to what I have to say. There's more, a lot more I could add to it. Really, there is. But the fact that you're willing to listen is amazing, man. It, 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 tro it shows me that you are a true man of God. And so let's continue this dialogue. I want you to take time to think about it and take all the time you need. It's an important subject because if we are to live... You know, man does not live by bread only, but by every word of God. And if that's true, then we ought to have every word of God. And if if there is every word of God, where is it? Show it to me. And I contend that the King James Bible is the perfect pure word of God in the English language. And... Um, I fully reject this idea that no Bible is perfect. Fully reject that. And uh, uh, obviously I, I fully reject the idea that there are originals because there are no originals. Uh, you can, I, could, I can't point to a source and say, look, there it is. There's no originals because there are no originals to show you. Okay. So anyway, that's enough. Appreciate it, man. Thanks, Chris, for for the comment and uh, have a Merry Christmas and hope to hear from you.